Y'all don't throw no stones at the messenger. You know, I'm, I'm just the mailman, the water boy. I'm just the one that's carrying the message. So if you're going to get mad, you got to get mad with God. Amen. I'm going to start a new series, and this is the one of the most controversial subjects that there is in all of Scripture, and that is speaking in tongues. Mm. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here, and those that are watching us via Facebook or Internet, welcome you to our morning service. Like I say, I'm just the messenger. Mm. Don't throw any rocks at me this morning. But what I would like for you to do is five sermons in this message. I would like for you to listen to all five of the sermons before you make a determination as to whether or not you believe or not believe or whether or not you believe that tongues or tongues is not valid in the 21st century. In the first century church, all the gifts were valid. Now, my question is, in the 21st century, that's today, are all gifts that was in the first century church valid in the church today, turn those down just a little bit. There. Are they valid in the church today? So I want you to listen to all of the sermons before you come to the your conclusion. Now, if you're going to understand speaking in tongues, you got to understand First Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. Chapter 12 deals with the gift. Chapter 13 deals with the control, and chapter 14 deals with the misuse of the gifts. So it's like a door. You have the wedge, you have the hinge, and you have the door. You know, the, if one is missing, you know, there's no understanding. You can't go to, to chapter 14, verse 2 or 3, and try to understand what the text says. You've got to understand all three of the chapters in order to understand the whole process. The Bible is very clear as to what it says about speaking in tongues. And I just don't understand how we get so out of whack. Uh, about the, the Bible is so crystal clear as what it says about speaking in tongues. With that said, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. When you have it, please stand in honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. As I read aloud, read along with me in your Bibles silently. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting with verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. And it reads this way. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would have you not to be ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led, even as you were led, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but except by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are a diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, I want you to remember that. The, in verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing, by the same spirit, to another the works of miracles, and another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of tongues. Verse 11 says, but all these worketh that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to each man severally as he will. Not as we will, but as he will let us pray. Father God, we thank you now for yet another opportunity to be here. We thank you, Lord, for our waking up this morning and, and our early rise. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We, Lord, we just thank you for taking care of us. Father, we thank you for just being here just one more time. We thank you, God, that we're able to come into your presence, that we're able to bring our cares and concerns to you. So this morning, we come not with our chest stuck out, we come in total humility and submission to your word. And Father God, as we come now to the word, I pray that you will lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom, that you would anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. 
you'll give me preaching power from on high that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase, that they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you and thank you, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I, I want to use as a reoccurring theme the charismatic chaos, part one. I was going to use the, the Corinthian catastrophe, but I, I, I was led to the charismatic chaos. I want to start a new series of sermons, which I've said is entitled the charismatic chaos. Paul is addressing the church at Corinth for their misconduct in the church. Now, the first thing we need to understand about this first letter to the Corinthian church, this is not a letter of of, 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 of positive. It's not a, a letter of Paul saying, listen, what you guys are doing is great. You know, two thumbs up. Keep up the good work. But the letter is a castigating and a condemning letter to the church at Corinth for their activity in the church. So my first question is, how are you going to build a doctrine off a castigating and a condemning letter of the actions in the church? Now, I don't see how folks they talking about speaking in tongues in the 21st century, but this letter was condemning and it was castigating them. Remember now, he described them as, as babes in Christ. They were carnal Christians. Yeah, well, I'm still a little bit too, too loud. Turn the volume down, number one. Turn the volume down. Now, he, he said that they were babes in Christ. They were, they were carnal Christians. That's good. Now, a lot of people don't like the word carnal Christians. You're carnal or you're Christian, but you got some folks that are saved, but yet they're still carnal, they're still worldly. There's a word called sanctification. Once you get saved, there's a process of sanctification. Now, some folks get saved and they never grow. And they're carnal and they are worldly. He said there was selfishness and immorality in the church. In other words, the church at Corinth was a mixed up, messed up church. In fact, it was no different than most of the churches today. There's total chaos. In most churches today, we're inundated with this new charismatic tongues talking, pew jumping, pew walking movement. This movement that is dooming and damning the churches of America because the first thing it does, it takes the focus off of God. And then put the focus on on man. We get to some churches. They may come and say, "Well, why don't you come to our uh, uh, come here uh, uh, our prophecy or come to our VIP uh, breakfast or come meet the the pastor?" Now, now that's pointing men to men. It is our agenda. It is our purpose to point men to Christ. So if there's a VIP parking. There's VIP breakfast. You get to sit on the VIP seating and have breakfast with the pastor. What about if I don't have a car? So I, I can't I, I can't be a part of this VIP P section and we say, won't you come and hear our choir? But why don't we come? What about the word of God? What about Paul said, I come to preach the word, not to baptize, but to preach the word. It's the great commission. I believe the church is have fallen asleep when it comes to the mission of the church. The church mission is to win souls for Christ. That's it. It is not to go feed nobody, it's not to clothe nobody, but born out of our love for Christ, this is what we do. But the church has one mission, and that's to win souls for Christ. And I believe we've lost it. I went to one church, and it was a fairly big church. I asked them about their evangelism program. They said, we don't have one. I don't care if you got two members or 200,000 members, you still should have an evangelism program because it's still all about winning souls for Christ. Amen. It might not be winning them and bringing them here to this church, but yet it's still winning souls for Christ. I believe we've been low to sleep as to the responsibility of the church. I often hear uh, most folks talk about this fivefold ministry. Now, let's just get back to the fundamentals, uh, fundamentals of the doctrine of the gospel. Why don't we just go back to the foundational principle and simply preach the word? It's not about the fivefold ministry, not being doctor, bishop, 
or the, the great reverend or whatever. How about just getting back to the fundamentals of just preaching what thus said the word of God? I think it's pretty simple. And stop trying to appease the people and dumbing down the word with cotton candy theology. And most churches you go to, they're going to preach a sermon that you want to hear to make you feel good. You're not going to go to most churches that are going to preach on sin. They're not going to preach on hell. They're not going to preach on the grave. They're going to preach on subjects and wish to make you feel good. And if you get upset or get, you know, mad and leave good. You know, if you walk out the door and say, I'm never going back to that church again. Blessed old, that pastor preached good. So let me tell you about the word. It's going to do two things. It's going to either draw you or drive you. That's what the word done. When the word is preached correctly, it brings about a conviction that brings about a change. If you're never convicted, guess what? You'll never change. So you got to hear the unadulterated word of God. And many people somehow, some way has misinterpreted the Bible. And the charismatic movement said that there's evidence of salvation by speaking in tongues. Show me that in scripture. Show me where it says somebody went to hell because they did not speak in tongues. Now I've never spoken in tongues. Does that mean I'm not saved? Of course not. The Bible says it's by faith that we are, are saved. Romans 10, 9 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Acts chapter 4 says, There's no other name than the name of Jesus that you can call on, that you can be saved. John 3, 16. There's the ignorance to the word of God, because the requirement of salvation is strictly by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not about being baptized. It's not about being good standings with the church, taking holy communion. Faith is the only requirement that is required for salvation. And most folks say, well, you don't know what I feel, or you don't know what I felt, but the evidence of what I've experienced. I don't care what you experience, it does not go over or above the word of God. Paul uses these 13 verses to refer to the usage of the gift. Like I told you, there's five sermons. So you got to, you, you've got to hear all five to understand what does say the word of God. But he used the usage of the gift or the variety of the gift. As we think on the subject, charismatic chaos, point one, I want us to observe three things about the use of the gifts. First of all, I want us to look at the subject of the gifts reminded. The second thing is the source of the gifts received. And thirdly, is the scope of the gift reviewed. Notice point number one, the subject of the gift that is reminded. Now Paul used the first 11 chapters to deal with the carnality of the, the, the Corinthian church. Now remember, this is a castigating, condemning letter for their conduct in the church. They had immorality in the church. It was one man that was in, in, in incest. He was in a relationship with his stepmother in the church, in the church at Corinth, approved of this activity. So Paul is writing a condemning letter to the church. I want you to keep that in mind. But now Paul turns to the subject of spiritual things or their spiritual maturity. Now they were, they, Paul said they come behind in no gifts. So they were believers and called them brethren. But yet in the midst of that, they were still carnal. They were still babes in, 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 in Christ. But notice the truth apprehended there in verse 1 and 2. Here is two dangers that plague Paul's mind. First of all, is the present ignorance. Look at verse 1. And it says, now concerning spiritual things. Remember now, he was talking about the carnal things. He changed gifts. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, that means they're saved. I would not have you to be ignorant. The word ignorant there simply means to be unlearned or on a form of spiritual gifts. Many base their beliefs or experiences and allow it to override the word of God. Now most folks will tell you, you can't tell me what I've experienced. I've experienced the evidence of speaking in tongues. I've experienced this. That does not supersede the word of God. It does not override what thus said the word of God. What you experienced or what you felt. Just because you're a good person, you're a nice person, you have a good reputation, that means absolutely nothing. Because that truth, thy word is true. Now there's a present ignorance that simply means to be un unlearned, to not know so many folks today simply just regurgitate what they heard someone else say. 
I can always tell when somebody's simply repeating what somebody, I know it's in the Bible somewhere. Now, if you have some kind of idea, you'll be able to, to isolate it. Maybe it's in the book of Romans, or maybe it's in Revelation, but most folks don't study the Bible for themselves. They have no understanding of the Word of God. They take the text out of context, use it as a pretext, and never be a text. Dr. D. Campbell Morgan made that up. I didn't. Many folks don't even study the Word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to give them understanding of the Word of God. Now, if you speak in, you speak in, uh, under the control of the Holy Spirit, you must be able to rightfully divide the word of truth. So I don't care if it's T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar, I don't care who it is, you must be able to rightfully divide the word uh, of truth. Just because it's T.D. Jakes don't necessarily mean that everything comes out of his mouth is correct. You better believe that. A Creflo Dollar. Some people take these guys as law, and the majority of the stuff that comes out of their mouth is incorrect. Theology, based on theology and doctrine, it is incorrect. Just because they are renowned does not mean that everything they say is right. You better be like the Bereans and Acts. You better go back and study the word for yourself. First of all, Paul said there was the present ignorance, and also there was the past influence. Look at verse 2. And it says, Know ye that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. See, they were heathens. That, that's without the knowledge of God. Many of the Corinthians had been one to Christ. They had a background in paganism. And it says, behind these dumb idols, they were familiar with the ecstatic utterances of tongues. Let me interject this. There's two words for tongues. Listen very carefully. There's glossolalia and there's delectos. Glossolalia, that means unintelligent gibberish. That's what we hear today. Delectos is where we get the English word dialect is the word language. So he's saying, listen, tongues, other tongues are tongues. You got to first find out which word it's referring to. Acts chapter 2, 10 and 19 is all delectos. The Peter, when he spoke at Pentecost, he spoke in tongues. And as a result of him speaking in tongues, they heard in their language. And 3,000 folks got saved because of the tongue speaking Peter. That's because they were able to hear and understand to come to know Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sin. Now translate that today in the 21st century and what we hear in churches today, that's what you call glossolalia. That's unintelligent gibberish. It's a bunch of a bunch of noise. And in fact, no one can say amen and no one can come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ based on what we hear today in this tongues talking, pew jumping movement that we have today because no one can understand what they're saying. I even heard one preacher stand and say, well, you know what I'm speaking, I, when I pray, I pray in the spirit and, I, and I'm praying to God and I, you, I don't even know what I'm saying. You best know what you're saying when you speak. You may be talking about God, Mama. You don't know what you're saying, but the Bible says you better get understanding and you better know what you're saying. Now that's just ignorant to me to stand up and say, I don't know what I'm saying. And that's the way most people are today. When I'm speaking in a holy language. When Paul said that in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was being facetious. He was simply saying, oh, is this you speaking? Oh, you speaking to angels? Ha ha, as if it's funny. But they taking it as law, taking it as doctrine, as if this is what Paul was saying that you ought to do. But in reality, Paul is saying this is what you should not do. For the scripture says that you speak in tongues that there's no interpreter. The scripture says you shall remain silent in the church. I, I can't get past that. Amen. If there's no one to interpret the tongues talking in the church, the Bible says you are to remain silent in the, in the church. So they were familiar with the unecstatic utterances of tongues. They knew the bondage of demon possession and demon obsession. They were in their were unconverted days. So they worshiped the goddess Diana. Now, at the feet of Diana, this is what they used to do. They used to have orgies. Back in the day, you know, they had temple prostitutes. And the problem, when you think about temple prostitutes, you, in your mind, you think about women. But in reality, they were men. But they used to be at the feet of Diana. They would have orgies. 
and they will froth at the mouth, and they will speak in, in ecstatic utterances controlled by the power of Satan and the devil. This is what they used to do on a normal basis. But then when they got converted, they became Christians. They saw the disciples speaking in delectos. They say, hey, we can do that too. They brought their pagan culture into the church with the unecstatic utterances that they had as they was having orgies at the foot of Diana by the control and the auspices of the demons and Satan himself. They brought it into the church and they say, hey, we can do that too. There's a vast difference between a language and unintelligent speech. Listen to me very carefully. Don't throw rocks yet. Just wait till the fifth sermon and then we'll go from there. Now he said that they were under a strong delusion and they was worshiping idols. The idols and that day was something that they made. You know, it's just like I go out and I get a stick, I carve a a little face on the stick and I sit it down in front of me and then I bow down and I worship it as God. You remember when Moses went up to the mountain and Aaron and the, and the gang, they went and got the gold and they made the, the calf and then they bowed down and worshiped the calf that they made. And they say, this is the God that brought us up out of Egypt. Now, common sense would tell you this calf did not exist prior to us making it. We was already up out of Egypt, so they made it and they bowed down to it. Charismatic uh, chaos is what we're talking about here. But not only the truth uh, apprehended there, but notice the test of plot. Look at verse 3. And it says, Wherefore, I gave you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit, by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, unsaved people, they can do both. Now, you can have somebody that's unsaved, but as lost as a green ball in hot weeds, can stand up in the pulpit and say, Jesus is Lord. Now, that can, that can happen, but the subject here is spiritual gifts and the use of spiritual gifts, the supernatural gift made operational by the Holy Spirit who controls the speaker at all times. However, they are capable of being imitated by evil spirits. So that's why when someone is speaking or someone is talking, you've got to go back and validate the source in which they are speaking. Now, just because the person is speaking don't necessarily mean they're speaking under the control of the Holy Spirit. A person can be lost and still stand and speak. And I use this illustration throughout the years. And uh, back when uh, Montel Williams, you almost said Jordan, Montel Williams come on, used to come on on Wednesday, there was a lady on there by the name of Sylvia Brown. I think if my memory serves me right, that's her name. And she was some kind of a prophet. Now, y'all can say whatever y'all want to say, but I believe that lady right there was demon possessed. I sat there and I watched her. She was talking to this young lady, and she said to him, this young you know, that she said to her, uh, your husband said, he was passed away, your husband said that uh, everything's okay. Um, he, he, he's in the kitchen. He stays in the kitchen with you. And, and, the, and Sylvia Brown said something, and the lady eyes got bigger than silver dollars. She said something that only that lady can know. Now, there is no such thing as dealing or uh, being able to communicate with the dead. What you're communicating with is demon spirits. And I believe that Sylvia Brown is a good example of, of dealing with, with the unholy spirit. First of all, you've got to consider the source. First of all, God told us never try to communicate with the dead. That's called necromancy. Never try to communicate with the dead. So if she is speaking based on the word of God, it is not of God because God said for us to never try to communicate with the dead. So the source says it's demonic. So we have to understand when someone is speaking, it's the source. Because anybody can get up and say that I'm speaking based on the authority of Scripture or by the Holy Spirit. But we must consider 
the, the, the source of what they're saying because Satan can imitate and duplicate all that God does. The test was whether or not they were speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit. What the contents they said, uh, was, it, was it right? And don't assume that the speaker is in control by the Holy Spirit. Now, just because they, they're they standing in a pulpit or they're standing on a platform with the Bible in front of them, that does not mean that they're speaking based on the control of the Holy Spirit. Notice the confusion there. He that distracts from the person and the work in the name of Christ, he is not speaking by the Spirit. Anytime a man gets in the pulpit and starts talking about what he has, I've got five bedlists. I got three summer homes. I got this home for the winter. This home, like, like one of the apostles of, of, of Frederick Price, he's always bragging about all that he has. He has a bit for every day of the week. He has millions and millions of dollars in the bank. That is not a man that is speaking by the Holy Spirit because he's distracted uh, everyone from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? It is, it is our job to appoint men and women to Christ. But the false teachers say that they have a message from God from you. Have that ever happened to you? Somebody walked up to you, you don't know them from Adam, and they say, God told me to tell you. And I say, well, first of all, pump your brakes. Before anything come out of your mouth, it had better line up with these 66 books. Whatever you say had better be found in the word of God. Or God didn't tell you anything. Like he said in Jeremiah, he said, I don't even know you. They're going around talking about God has told me to tell you. God said, I never had a conversation with him, and I don't know him. Half of the people that say God told me to tell you, God ain't told them nothing. You know, I'm on the main line. I talk to God every day. If God got something to say, why don't God just tell me himself? Why does he have to tell Deacon Swanson to tell him to tell me when I talk to him on a daily basis? If God got something to say, I'm pretty sure he's going to tell me. Now, now that, that's validation. Now, I could be pondering on something and God could use him to confirm something, but God is not going to tell him to tell me anything. And if, it, if, and if he does, it had better line up with the word. I tell them, first of all, don't say nothing outside these 66 books. God ain't never said I was going to win no lottery. And I, God ain't never said it's my year. God ain't never said you're going to get a double portion this year. God ain't, it, that's not found nowhere in Scripture. The Bible says you be a good servant. That's all that it says. And these folks get up here and prophesy over these folks' lives, telling them you're coming out this your year. If you're living in sin, I know it's not good grammar, but it makes a point. You ain't coming out. It ain't your year. You ain't going to get a double port. You ain't going to get no man, no woman, till you get it right with God first. Amen. And most folks just want to sit there and prophesy all over your life but we first we have to try the spirit and see if the spirit is is of god first john 4 3 allow me to read it to you and it says in every spirit that confess not jesus christ is coming to flesh is not of god and this is the spirit of antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world now this said the spirit of antichrist this is not the antichrist which speaks of in the book of the revelation the spirit of Antichrist, the anti simply means against Christ. There is a spirit now, in the world now, that is against God. If you don't know that, you haven't been watching television. You don't watch the news. They're taking prayer, Bibles out of school. We don't want Jesus Christ. We don't want the church. We don't want anything to do with God. We live in a world that, that has a source of Antichrist that already has begun. But notice the confession there. First of all, you must confess Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, and he's God that come in the flesh. No evil spirit can voice either one of the truth. The Spirit of God cannot call Jesus a curse. First of all, you got to get saved. When you ask Jesus Christ to come in your life immediately, immediately the Spirit enters in you and you are saved that very moment. There is no tarrying. There is no way to, like, they get you to come down or they take you in the back room for an hour and they get you. You got to say, Jesus, 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 until you start frothing out the mouth, start speaking in tongues. Most people just get tired and they just start speaking in tongues so they can go home. 
then jump up and say he, he's coming in a Honda. And they say, oh, you can go home. You've been speaking in tongues. I see the evidence of your, your salvation. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that nanosecond that we say it, we are saved. There's no such thing as tarrying and waiting for the Holy Spirit. Show me that in Scripture. As you go back to the book of Acts, again, Acts is a transitional book. We're transitioning from the Gospels to the church. Now, you cannot build a doctrine on a transitional book. Amen. Now, it's just like the church. Now, I do the cleaning. I clean the bathroom. Do you think T.D. Jakes clean the bathrooms? Of course not. This is a transition. This is a church that's been pioneered. This is a church that is transitioned and is growing. You can't build a doctrine on the way that we do things now compared to the way we're going to do them later. So you take 1 Corinthians, which is a letter of condemnation and castigated and condemnation, and also the book of Acts, which is a transitional book, and now you're trying to build a doctrine off of two books that you should not try to build a doctrine off of. Most folks say this, but the Spirit, the Spirit of God cannot call Jesus cursed. Now, that's something that cannot happen if you're truly saved. And I've heard a lot of folks curse Jesus, but I don't think I ever heard one really cursing while they were standing in the pulpit in, in a church. But I've seen them outside on the platform cursing, but the test that's applied. But notice charismatic chaos. We looked at the subject of the gifts reminded, but notice the source of the gift that is received in verses 4, 5, and 6, the person that's revealed in verse 4. And it says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different gifts, but it's the same God. Now, there's, a, there's different gifts, but it's, the, but it's the same God. It's the triunity of the Trinity is working together and to bestow the variety of gifts to the believers. There are different characters and purpose behind them in the Trinity. But listen, we can find unity and diversity only in God. Let me say it again because all y'all ain't listening. There's unity and diversity only in God. Now don't try that when you get home because I don't think it's going to work. Only in God there's a diversity, there's a variety of gifts, but there's still only one God, and he's the one that gives the gift. There's only one God, and he's equal in power, and God gives gifts to man, not man to himself. So in the church of Corinth, and I'm jumping a little here, they wanted to cover the best gifts. Out of the nine gifts that are here, we're going to walk through each one of them before we finish the lesson today. What they wanted to do is everybody wanted to show me gifts. Everybody wanted to speak in tongues. Everybody wanted to, to prophesy. Nobody wanted the, 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 uh, the other smaller gifts of, of healing. But everybody wanted to prophesy. Everybody wanted to show me gifts. When you start speaking in tongues, you, 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 you remove the focus from God to you. And when you start speaking in tongues, it will make you kind of look more spiritual than everybody else. As you look into them flying back and forth across the platform, speaking in other ecstatic utterances as if they're more spiritual than anybody else in the room. And sometimes people say, well, why can't I do that? You know, maybe I'm not as spiritual as they are. I've never spoken tongues. I don't know how to do that. And we go home, I guess some people practice and some of them teach you, but it's a gift that's given. It is not learned. I remember listening to one of the prominent preachers here in Jacksonville. He passed away now. He used to get him down in front of the church and he would say, repeat after me, time my time, time my time. Now say that real fast. Time my time, time my time. You know, and he's sitting there teaching them how to speak in tongue when it says it's a gift that is given by God. It is not something that you learn. So folks today have misinterpreted the word of God. There's various uh, uh, gifts, but there's only, listen, there's only one God, but there's various uh, gifts. Notice the purpose that's recognized there, but there's various gifts. There's one God. God is, has unlimited uh, diversity. In God, there's unity. In diversity, again, just like a fingerprint, there's no two fingerprints that are the same. Any of you familiar with the snow? I know Rhonda 
uh, from New York familiar with the, the snow there's no snowflakes that are the same personalities are are different but the purpose of the gifts are for serving the God serving God and not self now listen the purpose for the gifts is for serving God and not serving self Every gift that's given is for the edification of the body. If I'm speaking in tongues, if you can't understand what I'm saying, are you being edified? The answer is no. no, you're not. But the gifts are given not for self, but for the edification of the body. Every gift that is given, and God has given each one of us in the body of Christ at least one gift. Everybody has at least one gift. And it's God's decision as to what gift you get. Now, at Church of Corinth, them boys were picking their own gifts. You know, I want to speak in tongues because I want to look spiritual. I want to, I want to, I want to prophesy. You know, I want to raise the dead. I want to do like Jesus did. But you know, they, they were picking their own gift. But the Holy Spirit is the one that provides the gift, not the man provides his own gift because God knows what's best for us. We are to point men and women to Christ. God is a God of order, not a God of disorder or chaos. God is never out of control, as we see in some churches today. In some churches today, you know, it looks like they're just going crazy. Everybody's running around in the church, jumping, rolling all over the, the floor. You got folks laying all on the floor. And I had one lady tell me, I said, well, if you're laying down on the floor, you can listen, you know, you can still hear the word of God. Now, well, why are you laying on the floor? You got perfectly good chairs. It would be more easier for you to sit, but they run around. It looks like total chaos because folks are running around, speaking in tongues, doing all of these unecstatic utterances, and it looks like total chaos in a lot of the churches. This is what you see on a daily basis, but God is never out of control. God is always in control and under control. But notice the power received in verses 5 and 6. It says the gifts are as a result of the power of God in the believer. God gives them the power to perform the gifts. Now the gifts are given by God and God gives them the, the power to perform the gift. Think about some of these singles. I often think about Whitney Houston when it comes to mind. Whitney Houston to me, you know, while she was living, I think she had the, the best voice out of all of the female singers. That's a gift that is given by God for her to edify the body of Christ. And how was she, when she would teeter back and forth, you know, between the gospel and then R&B and then the gospel and R&B, but if God has given us a gift to do anything, it's for the edification of the body. She should use her voice strictly for preaching or singing gospel. God did not give us the gifts that edify the world, but it's there to edify the church. You got some churches that are, are suffering because we don't have singers, we don't have choirs because they're too busy in the secular world trying to make a dollar bill. I remember Amy Grant started off in the church. She said, oh, it wasn't enough money, so she switched over to R&B, and Amy Grant does the same thing. She goes back and forth. She said, it's not enough money. It's not about money. It's about ministry. God has given you that gift. That gift is for the edification of, of the body. It is God that gives us the power to perform the gift. And I often ask, what makes a person faster than another person? You know, we, you know, you might say size. Now, I've seen two people about the same size. One of them can blow the other one away. What makes a person, we all got legs, we got muscles, we got kneecaps and everything else, but what makes a person faster than another person? That is a gift from God. Now, it is not based on just sheer muscles. You can go in the gym and, you know, muscles big as all outdoors, yet you still can't outrun some of the smaller guys that don't have any muscles. Or some of the guys that do have muscles, they are as fast, but that is simply a gift that God has given you. And it should be used for the edification of the body of Christ. I don't care if you're in the NFL like Tebow. You ought to use it for the edification of the body. The money that you make ought to be for the church to use, that the church can prosper, that the church can fulfill the Great Commission instead of you in the strip club making it rain. God has given us every gift that we have. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, we receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit, the power to carry it out. God works through different people in different ways, but it's the same God that achieves his purpose throughout them. So God, in his infinite wisdom, has given this church, Blessed Hope Missionary Baptist Church, is a body. Every church, a local church, is a body. And within that body, God has provided everything that that church needs. That's based on the of uh, the people. They need to be in the right place, doing the right thing. God has placed them within the body, and God has given everybody a gift, and the gift that we ought to use while we're in the church. So everybody have at least one gift. Now, if you don't know what your gift is, that simply means you're not in the Word, you're not in the Spirit, because if you were, you would know what God has called you to do. You would know your gift. Amen. God will reveal it to you through His Word and through His his spirit that I have a gift of, of preaching and I have more than one not to get into the, the gift but everybody have at least one one gift it might be a gift of, of help you might be a person that's organized or you got some people that's disorganized if you're an organized person you ought to say amen because that's a gift because not everybody <laughs> is organized I consider myself as a fairly fairly organized person. But that's a gift that God has given you just that you are organized because some people are just totally chaotic and you can say well what in the world you know how can you find anything? But it's a it's a gift that God has given us. We're talking about charismatic chaos. We looked at the subject of the gifts reminded the source of the gifts received but notice last and finally the scope of the gifts revealed there in verse 7 through 11 the bulk of the text. First of all look at the explanation there. Each gift is given by the Holy Spirit for the common good of, it says with all, or the word is all. When there's a gift given to the believer, it is for the good of them all. Who is all? The body of Christ. The gift is to benefit the body of Christ. Not to benefit self. So I don't understand, just with that little bit that we preach, just the first 11 verses of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we get some folks that they're standing up and they're speaking in other static utterances that no one can understand what they're saying. If someone come in off the street, the, the scripture says that, that they would think that you were crazy. If they walk in off the street, hear you speaking in tongues, they would think that you're a lunatic. That's what I didn't say that the Bible said that. You know, the Bible says that how can I say amen if I can't understand what you're saying? You've got to speak in a language that's understandable for the church to be edified so everybody will come to know Jesus Christ. Or if you know Jesus Christ, faith coming by hearing, hearing coming by the word of God. You've got to hear and understand faith in order to grow. How can you grow if you're speaking in a language that I can't understand? Or there is nobody there to interpret the language. But the gift is given by the Spirit for the common good of all. The manifestation is not for the outshining of the human talent. But it's the implant of the power of God. The gifts are the benefit the church. Not an ego builder for an individual. And that's what they were doing in the church of Corinth. It was an ego builder. They were selecting the, the most show me gift. They were selecting the gift in which they could stand and they can look more, more spiritual. It is not my choice to be a preacher. God has appointed me to be a preacher. It is not my choice. This is not even a job that I desire, nor that I want it. I really don't even want it now, but yet God has called me to do it and I have to do it. If y'all just know what I have to go through in the run of a week and all that's transpired in, in with just a small church, but just imagine if the church was 20, 10,000, 5,000. Just, just imagine, you know, what a pastor has to go through. But this is not something that, that I selected on my own. God gave me this gift. If you go back to Jeremiah, it says before Jeremiah was even born, God had already ordained him as a minister. And as you grow, God puts you in position to get you where he wants you to be. But it's not my desire, but not only the explanation, but notice the example. And they can be divided into three groups. And I, 
I close with this, the comprehension, the confirmation, and the communication. But notice the comprehension there. Look at verse 12, excuse me, verse 8, the inspiration. Verse 8, and it says, for one is given by the spirit of, of wisdom. That word wisdom there is the spirit of, of inspiration. Now listen, now in the first century church, <laughs> whether you believe it or not, there were no Bibles. All they had was the Old Testament scrolls. And it was still not canonized. So that simply means that everybody had a little piece. You know, Deacon Swanson may have may have uh, Joshua chapter 14. Pastor McFarland may have Joshua chapter 24. Didi, she, she may have Joel chapter chapter 1. So, so the Bible what was not complete. But yet, through the inspiration of God, even though there was no Bible, only partial writing, the gift of the Holy Spirit would give them access to the New Testament, even though the New Testament was not written yet. Now, how do you think, you go back a hundred years, and a lot of the hundred years when these churches began, a lot of these black preachers, they could not read. Now, how can you preach the Word of God, and you can't read? They had somebody to read. And based on the gift that God had given them of inspiration, even though they could not read, but God would give them the gift of understanding and interpretation. They will read and they will expound. Now that's a gift from God. Amen. Now that's why we get out of the day, get in each church and read. They don't even know where that comes from. If you can read, read the text for yourself. And then you step all over them anyway. Why are they trying to read you talking over them? But the purpose was the gift of inspiration of wisdom. They would say read and immediately the spirit would give them understanding of the text that they can expound in order to edify the body of Christ. Amen. Number two is knowledge. Knowledge where it's able to expound on the word of God. That's communication of truth. This is what I'm doing today. I, it, I, I'm not telling you anything new. We'll get into that prophecy thing in a, in a minute, all these proper liars. We'll get into that in a minute. But knowledge is just expounding on the word of God. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved as a workman unto God. It is my responsibility as a pastor, as a, as a minister, as a preacher to study the word of God. And the Holy Spirit would give me knowledge and understanding of the word. Somebody might say, well, you know, pastor, I tried to read and, and I didn't understand. It. Now, before you read, you must talk to the author of the book first which is the Holy Spirit. And ask the Holy Spirit now, now I'm, I'm going to read this, but I want you to give me understanding and the supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit can give you understanding of the Word of God as you read it without the pastor being there. Amen. That's a gift. That's given. That's the gift of knowledge. The Holy Spirit reveals it to us, not only the comprehension, but notice the confirmation there. And it says also of faith, but not saving faith, but the miraculous faith that enables certain people to move mountains, faith that commands things to be done, and they are done. Let me read one, one verse to you, Acts chapter 13. Verse 11, don't turn to it, I'll just read it to you. And it says, And behold, now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and I sh and thou and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on them a mist of darkness, and he went around seeking for someone to lead him by the hand. It's that kind of faith. If I speak it and say it, it is done. He caused the man to go blind for a season. That's the kind of faith. That's a gift that God has given. But not only faith, but there's healing. The healing, the supernatural healing, medical science can, and wonders of medicine and surgery. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about the healing that enables one to be possessed and be made whole that is performed in an instant and permanent. That simply means, you know, how Paul and also Peter, they did miracles. You remember Peter with the man, as he walked into the temple, the man was lame from his birth, and Peter told the man, stand up and rise. And Peter, he looked at Peter, and Peter said, well, silver and gold I don't have, you know, but what I do, I'll give to you. And he told him to rise up and walk. They could perform miracles at will. 
But see, that does not apply to us in the 21st century. There's no such thing as a healing ministry. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, God can heal whom he wants to when he wants to, but there's no healing ministry. You can't go set up a tent on Normandy and have people come walk down the aisle, throw the cane and the walkers and all that, and heal anybody you want to heal. If that's the case, if you have that kind of power, I often ask people, why don't you just go to Baptist? Start on the first floor and clear the whole hospital out. If you got power to heal, go to the hospital, then go to Shane and go to Memorial. And by the end of the day, I want everybody to be healed if you got power to heal. Why do you have to have a tent and the sick people got to come to you? Why don't you go to them? Because that stuff is rigged. They already done proved that a lot of that stuff is rigged. Now, based on the, 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 the prayer of the believer. God can heal anybody he wants to. Now, don't get me wrong. God does the healing. Man does not have a healing ministry. I cannot walk up to you and say, okay, you're going to go blind for a season. Whoop, there it is. It don't work that way. That was a gift that was given to them. That gift is no longer operative today. God is the one that does the healing. But also, uh, a miracles. That, that word miracle, dunamis, power. Untrim, unhindered, uh, unpowered, unequal power. Now, there was a reason why we did signs, miracles, and wonders. We heard that before, right? Signs, miracles, and wonders. There's a reason why. First of all, it was to validate the man of God and the message of God. They, there was no Bibles. We had no canonization of Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. We didn't have the Bible in 66 books, leather bound with the thumb index, with all of Jesus' words written in red. They didn't have all that. So if I walked up and say I'm a man of God and I've got a word of God, I can validate it by signs, miracles, and wonders because there's no word. But the Bible said when that which is complete, teleos, mature, has come, these things will cease in and of itself. I don't have to do signs, miracles, and wonders anymore because I have the word of God. I don't have to validate who I am. The word does. I don't have to do signs, miracles, and wonders because the word has been canonized. And it says, when it has come, these things shall cease in and of itself. Number one is tongue. When it come, the word of God come, then tongue shall cease in and of itself. And most people want to say, well, that's Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ is coming, and gone, and you're still speaking in tongue. So you're still wrong. There is no way to validate speaking in tongues in the 21st century church. When we have the Bible, there is no longer the signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, don't get me wrong. God can do whatever he chooses to do. But it's not to be done by me to validate who I am in God. Because we have the Bible. Once this book was complete, a lot of these gifts were were, were done away with. So as to validate the messenger and the message, the miracles were performed, also could be formed by evil ones, or also it can be contagious. You know, once you do one, show me another. Show me another. People were following folks just because they were performing miracles. But notice the communication there. First of all, it says, and prophecy. Prophecy simply means to express the truth. Prophecy deal with the hidden truth of future events, like 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 John, and, and like he was on the Isle of Patmos, and and God gave John the book of the Revelation. That's what you call prophecy. That's in the true sense of what a prophet is today. Now listen to me very carefully. A lot, a lot of folks gonna disagree with me, but that's good. That's fine. There's no such thing as a prophet in the 21st century. Now, if this is the complete word of God, and it is. This is God's complete revelation. These 66 books. So what is God going to tell man outside of this book? Absolutely nothing. If he does, that means my Bible is not complete. I'm going to go to the back. Revelation chapter 23, verse 1. Because Dr. Johnny come lately. Dr. Divine said. And I better start writing down what he said if God is still revelating. This is the complete Revelation of God. There is no prophet, a master prophet. So when they get up and prophet lie over your life, you should automatically know whatever come out of their mouth had better line up with this word. Amen. If not, the Bible says you ought to take them outside of the city and stone them to death. See, they, ain't, they must have forgotten about that part. 
and they sit and they prophesy. lie. And you know, one thing about, about prophets, let me say this, you can go back to the Old Testament and you can read every prophet in the Old Testament. And probably 97% of all prophecies was negative. Now tell me one time you've heard a prophet in the 21st century say anything negative. They walk up to the point, you're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. It's always you coming out. It's always you're going to get your bow. It's always you're going to get this. It's a double portion. God's going to put it. It's, it's never negative. Never once have I heard anybody say anything negative. You go to the Bible. I get, I, as a matter of fact, I can't remember but one thing that any prophet said that was positive. Even the, uh, the king said, no, 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 don't go get him because Jeremiah, he never has anything good to say. Don't go get him because he's always negative. But yet the prophets today, but there is no such thing as, as prophet. And, and prophecy, it has to give you the idea of the revelation of new truth. This kind of truth that would never be known to man if God wasn't going to reveal it. This is all that there is in these 66 books. So when I stand before you every Sunday morning, I stand before you as to communicating the truth. Not new truth, but I communicate the truth. I'm just expounding on what this book says. That's all I'm doing. I don't have anything new to say to you. I don't have anything new to make up, brand new. I'm just simply saying what thus says the word of God. And all these folks that call themselves prophets and, and master prophets, they are prophet liars. There's no such thing as a prophet in the 21st century. Not only prophecy, but there's the discernment of spirit. Because of evil and wicked men, they have the ability to read the thoughts and intents of a wicked heart. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They sold their property. And they came to the apostles and said, we've sold it for so much. And, and the, the, the apostles then had the, had the gift of discernment. He could, Peter could read their, their heart and tell that they were lying. You know, that's a discernment that we still have. you got to be able to read, read between the lines because you have evil folks and wicked things. So you have to have a discernment of the spirit to tell what is right and what is wrong. Now, you can go to a church and you can hear something wrong. There's the gift of discernment will tell you that what he just said is wrong. You know, and you might say, well, I don't even know the answer. But I know that's not it. I know that's not right. I know based on, based on what? Based on the gift of discernment that God has given each one of us to say, hey, that's not right. If you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, trust me, the Holy Spirit will reveal what's true and what's error if you listen to it. Amen. But not only the, the primary gifts, prophecy and discernment, but notice the passing gifts still under the communication is tongues and interpretation of, of tongues. And we're going to get more into this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in the third uh, lesson. Tongues are languages. Paul says, I speak in more tongues than you all. Even Paul said, I would rather speak ten words in my understanding than to speak all these words in other ecstatic utterances. Paul said, I would rather speak ten words in my understanding than to speak as you speak in unecstatic utterances. But the word tongues, the lectos, and where we get the word languages from in Pentecost. And Acts, at, uh, Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost when Peter stood before the people and he preached. And they said that we heard in our own language. Now the miracle was in the speaking of the hearing. It's debatable. But he was speaking in tongue and they understood each one of them in their own different language as to what he was saying. And as a result of him speaking in tongue and them hearing and understanding, 3,000 folks were saved and then the church began. Now, what you hear today, does that sound like anything like Acts chapter 2, 10 and 19? You know, I can't understand what you're saying. So if I am lost and I need to uh, find Jesus and I want to get saved, if I walk into a church and you're speaking in understanding utterances, I can't even say amen, which means I'm in agreement to what you're saying because I can't understand what you are saying. But tongues is a language and it's for the edification of the body. Let me give you a good example and I'm going to move on. I'm almost done, huh? I'm over my time. If I go to Japan and, and God said, I want you to go preach to the Japanese. 
And I say, well, Lord, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how to speak Japanese. And instantly, God gave me the gift that I'm able to speak in a language that I've never learned, but for the edification of the body that they might learn to know Jesus Christ. That's the true meaning of tongues. God gives it to you supernaturally. You might not know. you got to understand. God gives it to you, but it's for the edification of the people. It's always for the edification of the body. Speaking or a gift that's given is never for self. This is never for just me. This is never for me to say, well, I was speaking in a holy language, and I was speaking under angel in a holy language, and I was speaking to myself and all of all of that you hear today. No, no. It's for the edification of the body. And it said there must be an interpreter, which is another gift. Now, most of the time, the one that speaketh in tongue is the one that does the interpreting. They had one guy, <laughs> Dr. Whitty, and I was told this story. He was he had a degree in languages, and he went into a church, and he spoke in tongues. And, and then the lady stood up and tried to cipher what he said, and he simply said, I said it in French, your parking lot has potholes that need to be paid. <laughs> that lady stood there for almost 20 minutes, trying to explain what he said, but he simply spoke in French, and said, your pavement has potholes that need to be paid. Mm. That's what he said, in a language, that's tongue, in a language, dialectos, it's a language. Paul says, I speak in more languages, in more tongues than you all. That word means language. I had one guy, a student of mine, he, from Kenya, he could speak 10 languages. Mm. 10 languages, that's dialectos, that's languages. That's what he can speak. Not, not the unextended gibberish that you hear today. But he can stand up here and speak ten different languages depending on who's in the audience that they can understand that they can come to know Christ as Savior and His Lord. I want you to remember, if you don't remember anything else I've said this morning, I want you to understand that every gift that's given is given for the edification of the body and not self. Amen. It is not just for me. But notice the, the equipping there. Lastly, there's various of gifts. But there's still one source. Mm -hmm. Behind the distribution of the gifts is the Holy Spirit. Everyone has at least one gift. And no man knows what gift is best suited for him. For it's the Holy Spirit that determines that. In the church of Corinth, they were picking what gift they want. They walk in the church and say, I want, I want to speak in tongues. I want to prophesy. You know, I want, I want, I want the bigger gifts instead of the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom or the gift of, of faith or healing. They said, no, no, no. I want, I, want to, I want to be able to speak in tongues. I want to interpret tongues. All you got to do is go get your tape recorder and record them speaking in tongues and record them interpreting tongues. Go back about seven months later and play it for them and tell you to tell them to interpret it. I double dog guarantee you they can't do it. If they stand up and say anything, I guarantee you it's not, what, it's not what that person said because the person don't even know what they said. But that's a dangerous place to be. But let me say this and I, and, and I close. No one should be proud or have pride or be upset with the gift that is given. Now, if you, if let's just say you're given a gift and your gift is simply knowledge or wisdom. I mean, you shouldn't be upset about it. You know, because you don't have the bigger gift. It's just like saying that you're part of the body. You're mad because you're not the heart. You're mad because you're not the arm. You're mad because you're not the lung. Every part of the body has a purpose. Just like in life, you have the gifts like being a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief. Then you got the little gifts like being a postman, you know, way down on the, on the line. But every gift or every ha has a purpose. If you didn't have the mailman, guess what? You ain't getting your mail. I don't care what the doctor do. He couldn't even get his book, his, his work for research, if it was not for the mailman. What about the trash? What if your trash just collected and you just put it outside every day? And it just collect and collect and collect. Everything has a purpose, so you can't say, listen, that I'm upset because I don't have the gift of prophecy or tongues. He said, because this is not an ego thing. This is a church thing. Amen. It's about the edification of the body. All the gifts that we get, when it's combined together, 
We form a body, and that body is for the edification of one another in this church. Amen. Now, any time it's just for you, and you use it for you, it is not a gift that is from God. God has equipped us with at least one gift for the edification of the body, and each gift is given by the Holy Spirit for the profit of, the text says, with all. That simply means all. It is not for self-edifying, but it's for the building of the body. I challenge you this morning, are you using the gift that God has given to you? Mm. Now, if you don't know, if you say, well, well, Pastor, I didn't even know until today that I had a gift. Mm -hmm. Well, I will consult with the Holy Spirit yes. and ask God to say, Lord, what is the gift yes. that you've given me? You take that gift and you use it. For the Lord. Like I tell people when they come into the, the seminary as a professor, as a teacher in the seminary, you know, I, I tell them up front, you know, I didn't give you an axe. God gave you the axe. I do, I'm just going to help you sharpen the axe. Amen. So when it's time to chop some wood, you got a sharp axe. I'm not the one that called you to preach. I'm simply here to help you in the process of what God has called you to do. I'm just here to help you sharpen your axe so when it's time to chop wood, you got a sharp axe. But you don't get the axe from me. You get it from God. Amen. So I tell them up front, I'm just here to help you get to where God will have you to be. Yes. Now, it's my challenge to you this morning that you use the gift that God has given you, whatever the gift is. And I want you to understand, God has given us everything we have is a gift from God. And it ought to be used for the edification of the body. No matter what it is, I can't even run fast, catch a football, shoot. Some people can't, like Shaq, can't even shoot a jump. But some, some folks just don't ever miss. You know, all those are gifts. That's God's giving you a gift. And it should be used for the body of Christ. Amen. 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 Everyone stand, please. The doors of the church are now open. You may come by letter. You may come by baptism or Christian experience.